So, um, as Jane Eccleese mentioned, I spent two months earlier this year working in Rachel's lab at Harvard, and my research looked at the group of marine-associated proteobacteria that she mentioned earlier, which turn out to be surprisingly common on washed rind and bloomy rinded cheese. So I thought I'd get us situated with a photo to start out with. This is a photo of rusticles, uh, which are like icicles but made of rust, on the bow of the HMS Titanic. And they're formed by an organ, sorry, the, the, the Titanic, which is, which is um, actually formed by a species of proteobacterium called Halomonas titanicae. So um, next slide, please. So just to refresh your memory, these were the results of um, Rachel's survey showing the major bacteria and fungi found on over 100 cheese rind samples, including many um, cheeses made by people in this room. And one of the surprises was the dominance of these gram-negative bacteria on the wash and bloomy rinded cheese, which you can see in all of these warm colors right here. So, as someone who had dealt with bacteria a lot more in the context of cheese than in petri dishes, uh, it was really fascinating to see and smell these cultured bacteria on the plates. Some were blonde and creamy colored and smelled like roasted chicken broth, and others were deep orange and smelled like sweet rotten fruit or oil paint or sour or plasticky or like the zoo. And these were all of these smells that I associated with cheese, but there was no cheese present at all, and I thought that was really fascinating to be able to take those two things apart and think about what parts of it might have been bacterial and what parts of it might have been cheese. And, um, you know, so it's very interesting that Rach, you know, Rachel and her team had then gone and looked and seen that maybe some of these proteobacteria, which smelled like such interesting things on the plates, actually did have all of these unique enzymatic pathways, which could be producing all of these very volatile compounds um, in vitro. So, next please. Um, so this is a diagram showing predicted interactions between the various different genera that they isolated from their cheese rinds. Um, and I should stress here that these are just mathematical correlations based on that big data set that created the figure that you saw earlier. So this isn't based on plating things together in the lab, but rather looking and seeing what things, what things went together. So when, what this shows is here's all the fungi down one side. Here's Geotrichum and Dibaramyces and so forth. Penicillium is down here. And then here are all our different um, bacteria across the top, and here are the proteobacteria right here. And what you can see is more often than, than not, they're found alongside Geo, which is really interesting. Um, and they're also, also, more often than not, not found with penicillium. So again, this may be that, su suggesting that they're interacting with one another, or this may simply be suggesting that they like the same environment. And so one of the things that we, um, they thought might be interesting for me to look at is to actually test out some of this stuff in practice. Okay, so. I thought we could get started just because I didn't really know what proteobacteria were when I was going into, when, into the lab, just to get us orientated um, and see what, what exactly we're talking about here as proteobacteria. So if you remember um, Rachel's diagram of all the domains, this is one of those three domains, the bacteria, broken down still further. So this is like a big family tree where instead of having it just horizontal across the middle, there's so many different things that we want to show that we've sort of twisted it around through 365, 365 degrees so that we could see everything that we want to see. So if you go on to the next slide, here's one phylum, the Firmicutes, which are really important in cheese. And um, obviously those showed up in, in Rachel's survey quite a lot. And I just wanted to kind of give an example of some of the different organisms that are found in this phylum. So it includes the lactic acid bacteria. Um, it also includes listeria. And it includes all of the staphylococci that we've been talking about earlier, for better or for worse, uh, things that are very useful for cheese making, but also things like Staph aureus, which might be problematic. Um, the next, uh, so proteobacteria sit over here, and you can see what a massive phylum this is, full of, you know, incredible diversity and many, many different kinds of bacteria. And if you go on to the next slide now, no worries, um, the, uh, the marine-associated bacteria I was looking at were part members of this class called gamma proteobacteria, and that includes things like the halomonas, 
and Vibrio and Pseudoalteromonas and Psychrobacter, which, are, which have mostly been isolated from these marine environments in which some of the species that, or some of the species that Rachel and Ben isolated were really 99.9% .9 identical to these species that had only really ever been isolated before from places like salterns and sea ice and deep sea vents and so forth. They aren't often found in soil or in raw milk or on farms. Other, others, um, oops, back. Other species that are found in this same um, class include hafnia, which um, Dr. Montel mentioned earlier in terms of something that's actually used as an adjunct starter culture, and also the enter um, enteric bacteria, Escherichia um, species, Salmonella, so again, some things that we would really not want to have around. And then it's just useful pointing out that, well, obviously, all of these um, phyla and classes can include, I mean, it's too simple to say the good guys and the bad guys. Certainly, there are reasons for concern for some of these gram-negative bacteria associated with cheese um, that Dr. Montel and her colleagues um, a couple of years ago published a really interesting paper where they did a survey of all of the different gram-negative bacteria on a group of French cheeses, and we're talking about how well they could have some very interesting sensory impact on the cheese. They can also be a source of biogenic amines, which are um, the, um, which, which are essentially responsible for um, which histamines or hist, uh, so it, what they can do is that they can um, create histamine, um, histamine in cheese, which can pr provoke an allergic reaction. And also, um, they can be a source of antibiotic resistance genes in the environment. So in some cases, you might not want to have them around. Nevertheless, there are a lot of them out there which are either neutral or quite possibly beneficial to the flavor of the cheese. So let's not throw away the, the baby with the bathwater. Um, okay, so continuing on. So the questions that I, um, that Rachel and Ben tasked me with exploring in the lab were, first of all, how are these proteos getting onto cheese? If they're only ever found in the bottom of the ocean, how are they getting onto people's cheeses? Can we show evidence of interactions between the proteos and the fungi, as might have been suggested by that correlation graph? And also, then, what are the mechanisms of interaction between these various proteos and fungi? And what effects, finally, do the proteos have on the flavor and the aromas of the cheese itself? So we go on to the first question. How are marine bacteria getting onto the outside of our cheeses? So there are two basic um, hypotheses for this. The first one is quite an interesting one, which is many cheesemakers use sea salt, and perhaps that sea salt is a, is a vector by which we can be bringing um, organisms out of the ocean and onto our cheeses. And then the second one is one that Rachel just alluded to as well, this hypothesis that in fact everything is everywhere but the environment selects, and the fact that people haven't been culturing proteos out of soil um, for the most part, or the, these particular proteos out of soil, could just be um, a side effect of the fact that they don't grow very well in soil, but that cheese provides a uniquely suitable environment for them to really thrive. So those were our two potential um, sources. And the first thing I did was to set out to test the sea salt hypothesis. So um, a couple of cheesemakers very kindly sent me some sea salt that they used, and we chose cheeses whose, um, who had been in the initial survey and where we had found a lot of proteobacteria. Um, and so what we did was we took this very rich broth and we um, put a huge amount of salt in it, and then we added a little bit of geo for good measure, because the first round of experiments, which Ben did much more, uh, much more conveniently in sort of little 10 milliliter tubes, failed to really grow very much from the cheesemaker's sea salt. So we decided we would hit it hard and give it everything we got and really thwack a lot of salt into this, and then give it some geo just in case that would help it go. And Voila, within 48 hours, we had managed to grow quite a lot of bacteria out of these cheesemakers' sea salts, which was really interesting and, um, you know, quite, quite challenging to a lot of people's preconceptions about the fact that salt is this very inclement material for a lot of bacteria. It's really salty and um, quite dry, and <laughs> there would be any number of reasons. I mean, we don't generally think of salt as something that is um, microbially active, and so to have two different salt sources, both you know, grow this bacteria in a relatively short time was a really interesting thing to see. 
So the next step was, oh, and here's another really interesting picture. Here's some of that geo that we put in, and you can see some evidence that these bugs that are growing within the sea salt are actually associated with the geo, and that's particularly interesting because there's, you know, within, um, within the, there's a lot of literature where they do research on proteos in the deep sea and where they talk about how in the deep sea environment, a lot of these um, proteobacteria are actually associated physically with eukaryotic hosts like invertebrates chitinaceous organisms, which have a lot of chitin in their cell walls, which actually happens to be also co uh, composing the cell walls of geo and many other molds. So the idea that maybe there's some actual physical binding going on here is a really interesting one. So. The next step was to identify what we'd gotten. And in just, just an instant, what we did was we streaked these different things out on plates to isolate the individual colonies. Then we extracted their DNA, which was quite a simple procedure. Uh, ben described it as like making cookies, but then at the end you don't get any cookies, which I thought was a very good way of putting it. <laughs> then we ran PCR to amplify a particular gene for which there's a lot of library information of lots and lots of different species. Then we ran um, a gel to make sure it had actually worked. And then we sent that off to a company that does a lot of sequencing, and within 24 hours they sent us back the DNA sequence of that particular gene for each of the organisms we were interested in, and we plugged it into a database, and they told us what was there. So, um, next is what species grew from the cheese salt. Now, the surprise here was that none of them actually was a proteo, and it was a little bit disappointing when we, when we ran those tests because we thought to ourselves, here was the missing link, but in fact, at least in, this, in these two salt samples from Hill Farm Dairy and Slate Farm, we didn't actually succeed in growing any proteos specifically. But what we did grow were four different species of bacilli. So, um, these, were, these were species that grew out of the sea salts, but I think it's important to note that proteos can also be cultured from different sea salts. So in that picture of all of the different sea salts waiting to be cultured on the bench top, you could see there was one that was quite cloudy. That was a sample of Celle de Grande from France, and that was absolutely teeming with proteos, and it was just as dry and as sort of, it was a little grayer than everything else, but we know that proteos definitely can survive in dry salts and then wake up later on. So just the fact that we didn't actually manage to find any proteos in those sea salts from the cheesemakers doesn't mean that that's not a potential ve vector for sea salts getting onto pe or proteos getting onto people's cheese. Um, if we go on to the next slide, though, one of the things before we start freaking out and telling everybody to go cook their salt before they apply it to their cheese for fear of contamination, Rachel suggested that I do a little experiment where I look at the interactions between these bacteria that we grew from the sea salts and listeria. So what we did was I grew, I plated a, list, a lawn of Listeria monocytogenes across the back of the plate, um, and then I spotted the different bacterial communities that we had grown from those two sea salts on top of that lawn. And you can see, very interestingly, that the slate farm bacteria have a clear zone of inhibition around them. So what that actually means is that they are killing the Listeria that are right around them on that plate. And you can see here, with, this, uh, with the Hill Farm dairy salt, that we had, I managed to isolate three different species of, bac um, of bacilli from that, and so I plated them individually, and then I plated the community all together. And the interesting thing here is to see that two of them aren't, um, aren't inhibiting the listeria by themselves. Maybe there's a little bit of inhibition around there, but it's hard to tell. But one of, the, one of them is definitely inhibiting it a lot. And this is a species called Bacillus subtilis, um, and it actually, in the literature, they've shown that it secretes a, um, an enzyme called surfactin, which has been shown to inhibit listeria in other places. So it's a really interesting lesson to us. I guess if you look here, the other important point is when we put all three of them together and put them next to the listeria on the plate, they didn't actually inhibit it. So it's really important to remember that what we're seeing here is something that we can do in vitro, but before you all rush over to Mary and ask if you can buy some of her sea salt, um, <laughs> we need to remember that this is just a, a, you know, a preliminary result that we've shown has a very interesting aspect in the lab. Nevertheless, I think it's a really important lesson overall that, you know, that when we think that we can control, you know, we, when we think we know better, sometimes we could be undoing something that might actually be doing us a world of good. So, 
the, that's my final point here, is not to think that all proteos on cheese come from sea salt. And it's really easy to demonstrate this because there are a lot of cheesemakers who don't use sea salt who have proteos all over the outside of their cheeses. So while we can show that sea salt can bring proteobacteria onto the outside of these cheeses, if there definitely must be many other ways for these bacteria to get onto the outside of the cheeses. And if I had to put money on it today, I would say that I really truly believe that everything is everywhere and the environment selects. And so for whatever reason, probably because these are really high moisture, high pH, high salt cheeses, we've managed to sort of culture bacteria at high levels, which probably don't grow in very many other places in the terrestrial environment, but just happen to also grow really well in the, in the ocean. Okay, so then the second part of my experiment, and I'll really zip through this uh, now, was to look at the bacterial and fungal interactions between these marine bacteria and a couple of key, um, key fungi. So we used 10 strains of proteos that were isolated from some of the cheese rinds that um, Rachel used in her study, and then three common cheese fungi. So we used um, geo, the Baramyces, and penicillium. And we did replicates at pH 5 and pH 7, so looking at it in an acid environment and then in a more neutral environment. And what we did was we grew the bacteria by themselves, and then we also grew the fungi by themselves, and then we did all the possible combinations and looked at what happened. So. Here, in a nutshell, is what that looked like in reality. You can see here's our freeze-dried cheese curd agar, ready to be turned into, well, cheese curd, ready to be mixed up with a bunch of other stuff and turned into cheese curd agar. And so we adjusted the pH of some of these in, to be pH 5 and other ones to be pH 7, and we did a lot of replicates of each because one little well isn't enough to tell us whether something's going on. We were looking for statistical significance. And so then we put 500 CFU um, of each... Uh, organism into the appropriate well, made all the various different crosses, and you could see that after two weeks of growing, there was definitely some interaction going on here. So if we go on to the next slide. The first thing I want to show, just as a, as a little background to this, is that one of the main things that fungi can do, which is an interaction, but it's not necessarily a direct interaction w with bacteria, is that, but that affects their growth, is that fungi are great deacidifiers. So over the course of that two weeks, the fungi that were growing in those little wells took what was quite acid um, media, and the geo turned of pH 5 to pH 6, and the penicillium actually raised that pH of that agar to over pH 7. So the fungi were actually lifting a potential abiotic, or um, not, not, not a living control, but an acidity control on the growth of the bacteria. So if we go on. So here's an example of what the results of that survey that we got out looked like in, um, in reality. So each of these rows here is from a single well, which we matched up and did a dilution of, and then we spotted that dilution onto plates, and then we used the amount that grew in that row to see how much was growing in that particular well. So doing this, this line down was actually just a way of getting a, a, a basic count of how many things were growing there. So you can see at pH 5, the Cycrobacter bacteria, when we grew it alone without any fungal partner, it didn't grow at all. It wasn't happy there. But when we plated it with geo, it grew quite a lot. It grew quite a lot with uh, Deberomyces, but it grew <coughs> less with penicillium. When we had it at pH 7 all by itself, it grew really well by itself. It grew really well with the others, but it grew slightly less well with penicillium. And what we're seeing there is that actually it looks like there are multiple different interactions going on. The fungi are obviously allowing, the, the, possibly through deacidification, allowing these guys to grow at a at, in the media that started out at a lower pH, but there's also likely an inhibition going on from the, from the penicillium as well as allowing it to grow. The other thing that I think is really interesting to look at is that not all of these strains were behaving the same. So again, here are three different sets of plates, all from um, all of different Vibrio spe species. So the genera is all, uh, the genus is all Vibrio, but the genera are all different strains. And you can see that each of them behaved in a slightly, well, these two behaved a little bit differently, but each of them behaved in a slightly different way. So here, you can see that Vibrio alone never liked growing by itself. But this particular strain was really promoted or allowed to grow by the geo and the debermyces, but not by the penicillium, whereas at pH 7, it did its thing 
without too much trouble. So again, I think the major point that I think we could draw from this is, again, vive la microbial terroir. Maybe Rachel might have found the same genera and her cheese is made from around the world, but that doesn't mean they actually behave or grow or taste the same. So, you know, it's really interesting to see these sort of macro scale patterns forming that we can really look at um, quite as, as a category, but at the same time within that, there's still a lot of room for very individualistic, very interesting phenomena to take place. So looking at it the other way, what um, we were just looking at what effect the fungi had on the bacteria. The other side, the other way of looking at it is to say what effect did the bacteria have on the fungi. And in this case, the answer is the proteos did not do a whole lot to the geo, either at pH 5 or pH 7. So here you can see these first columns are, have no bacteria in them at all, just the geo. It grew fine. But then with all the other bacteria, it also grew fine, which kind of goes along with what Rachel was saying about the fact that these Fungi, in general, don't care a lot about what's going on bacterially in their midst. But if you look at the penicillium results, this was really interesting as well. So go on. So here, you can see at pH 5, basically, penicillium grew just fine no matter what. But at pH 7, there was a strain of Pseudoalteromonas that really, really knocked back the growth of the penicillium, which is quite interesting because it bucks the trend that Rachel was talking about. And in reality, on our plates, we saw that there were two strains that behaved this way that really seemed to be killing or at least really inhibiting the growth of the penicillium um, when they were grown at pH 7, which it might be what it was like on the outside of a cheese. So if we go to the next slide, we can see what this looked like on that 96-well plate that generated this data. You can see here are all of these bacteria plated alone. And here are all the fungi, which are in these rows. So you essentially, we have a grid where we cross them all. And here's the pseudoalteromonas that was being graphed. And you can see it's completely prevented this penicillium from, from sporulating, from canidiating. And here, this other, this other strain, the pseudoalteromonas 6261, has stopped it from growing altogether. So that's really, really interesting because, again, it's, it's a totally different sort of interaction um, than, than we had seen in other places. So if you go on to the next slide, all right, you ask, so what? But perhaps there could be some practical applications for this sort of a, for this sort of a species. This is a bloomy rided goat's cheese, um, which did, in the survey, have quite a lot of proteobacteria growing on the outside of it. But actually, we also have a lot of problems at certain points of the year at this cheese, having a lot of unwanted penicillium growth all over the outside. And you think maybe a different strain of proteo might be really useful for actually knocking back that blue mold or preventing it from turning blue or from doing, you know, it, it could be a really practical uh, and useful thing. At the same time, I think there might also be lower tech ways around that, things like making sure that the, um, that the cheese is drained properly, that there's not a lot of extra lactose around and so forth. So I think one of the really interesting things is to see what you can do from a holistic cheese making point of view and then what other kinds of options there might be for, you know, knocking back, knocking back that blue a little bit. Then again, as you'll see t on tonight's cheese board, another approach is just to embrace the blue mold. And, <laughs> and I can uh, speak up for that one as well. So then further work that might be required for this is um, certainly repeating the experiment to get stronger statistical significance. It seemed to me like we did a lot, lot of replicates, but I think it's not ultimately it wasn't enough to get the kind of statistical significance that we'd really be looking at to get something that we could really publish. Um, but certainly a second round could take us a long way in that direction. Secondly, we've, got, we've shown that there are some possibly quite complex interactions taking place, but we haven't really had a chance yet to look at the mechanism of interaction. Are they actually binding to one another? Are they interacting in different ways? So that's a, that's a potential area for future study. And then finally, examining the actual effect of some of these proteos on the flavor and aroma of cheese. So there have been a few other groups that have done some of this work, and certainly um, I should cite Ben's work as well, looking at how these, uh, these gram-negative bacteria do have these very interesting metabolic pathways that can produce quite volatile compounds, sulfurous, or with, uh, with other really interesting um, flavors that can have a really big impact on what we take home to, and put on our cheese boards at the end of the day. So finally, to acknowledge, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you very, very much to Niels Yard Dairy for allowing me to spend two months in Boston and supporting my time there. It was really amazing. And then also to um, Mary Holbrook and Will and Caroline Atkinson for sending me some of their salt. And then finally to Rachel and Ben and Julie for being immensely hospitable and supportive while I was working with them. So that's it. Thank you.